Hey, it's Joel. I'm at Seattle Children's Hospital with Kaylin. Hey, man. Hey, how you doing? I'm doing all right. Kaylin's a doctor here at Seattle Children's, and we're going to talk about things that are 3D printed that are actually saving the lives of children. So the, the main forms are 3D printed, but we also have some things that are machined. This was built, but, but it has 3D printed elements. Absolutely. Okay, well, we'll talk about Every this one in a bit. Every piece includes 3D printed elements. There we go. Everything <laughs> includes 3D printing, which is why I'm here. That's, why we're That's here. the exciting part. Absolutely. So let's start over here. Some of the most complex problems that we take care of in pediatric airway work include things like tracheas that are too narrow. So your trachea is your windpipe. You got to move air through it. Right. If it's too narrow, the air doesn't move very well. And right. that makes it hard to breathe. Okay. And that can be life threatening. So we have ways to improve that with surgery, but it's a very complex high risk surgery and things that are high acuity, low frequency events are perfect for simulation training and 3D printing is a really important tool for that. If you have the ability to train, even train based on that specific geometry of the person, the chances of it being a success go way up, right? Yeah, so that would be patient specific rehearsal or advanced surgical planning. And those are things that are kind of up and coming concepts within surgical planning and preparation and really important in my opinion, absolutely. That's kind of echoed here within these, right? These yeah. are tracheas, am I, am I correct? In these saying are that? tracheas, okay. yeah. This is a replica of a patient's trachea and this is being wrapped around by the large blood vessels and the heart. So we have options to look at these patients with just the trachea or with the structures that are around it. Oh, I see. So in 3D printing these models, what makes <clears throat> it highly beneficial is that you can isolate specific pieces of the body or print the pieces of the body in context with other members of the body. We have all those options That's open so, to us. <laughs> so amazing. Because it's all taken from imaging, which we have all those structures on the imaging. These are squishy. It's not like bone, right? This, these are soft, squishy structures. The fantastic benefit is that these feel and cut very similarly to the, the tissues that I cut during surgery. So we oh. can prepare in a much more specific and useful way it's when we have that ability of replicating the fidelity that we see in real life see this? with this model. And then I would imagine <clears throat> if you're if you're training with a 3D printed model and with it being able to cut and feel similar to what you would in the body, if for some reason a nick was made that wasn't on purpose, or if you have an idea to try something different, with additive, you can do that without having to try it on the actual body. That And that's what I think is so powerful about this, an application of this technology into this work, is that when we are trying to you know, both for teaching and for evaluating surgical techniques, we can perform a surgery on this model and be that much more confident that we're doing patient specific preparation to be ready for that patient. But also if we wanna try a different surgical technique, we can iterate that surgical technique in you know, three different variations, have 27 different surgeries performed on the same pathology and then evaluate which have a bake-off to determine which is the best model. <laughs> a bake-off. So right? in that bake-off, are you actually, well, a bake-off has a taste test, but in this sort of application, <laughs> you would have some sort of test to see whether yeah. each individual technique was applicable or was better. Is that correct? And that's where computational fluid dynamics comes in because we can look at each of those post-surgical models and determine which would be the best from a flow perspective. Oh, and when it's, dealing with the airway, that's, it's all, it's all, it's about, all flow. about flow, right? I mean, it's great if it looks nice, but if it actually moves air more effectively, that's what we're trying to accomplish. So this is, this has had surgery. Yeah. This These is are a actual post-operative model. Yep. Oh, wow. That was performed by one of, one of our surgical team and that's the post-operative result. Okay, does the patient know that advanced surgical planning has been done with 3D printed models? So many of our patients are four months old, so they don't actually care <laughs> very much whether this was done or not. But well, I, will I, say, I think of Children's Hospital as being birthed to at least, you know, 18. 18, 21 right? actually for oh. most of them. But I will say their, their parents and families that really do, do understand that this is being done and really do care about that. Do they ever ask for the planning models? We, at the time of surgery, we generally give a model to the family. Do you really? Yeah. Oh, that's amazing. <laughs> and we've had moms who have carried this around in their purse for years to, ex sure. <laughs> to explain to people. This goes beyond patient education as well. If I had a 
surgery and I wanted to tell someone about it, that person is going to be way more engaged, hopefully, in what I'm saying if I can show them something to correlate my words to. Yeah. And it's one thing if you're describing somebody to somebody how you had your knee cleaned out for an arthroscopy, but it's another thing if you're trying to tell someone you had a slide tracheoplasty on cardiac <laughs> bypass and they're like, oh, what, what? So, you know, being able to you do that in much more concrete, descriptive terms has been really valuable for a lot of families we've talked to. I see other things here that kind of aid in planning. Is that right? So that each thing here is a different adventure in additive manufacturing. <laughs> so, and each of them has kind of a different purpose and different goals. With the slide tracheoplasty research, we've been able to use that for you know just standard slide tracheoplasty work, which is I'm too narrow, I need to be bigger, and I do a slide tracheoplasty on it. Everything down to I've got an extra takeoff long before it should, and I got have to fix it that a way. Takeoff. What is a takeoff? So this is going up to the right upper lobe, and it's supposed to come off down here, and instead it comes off up here. Oh. And so the technique that you would use to repair this with a slide tracheoplasty is very different than what you would use to repair this with an early takeoff of, off of the right upper lobe. Oh, I see. And I, it, I see. it's still yeah. a slide tracheoplasty procedure. But that's where the patient-specific rehearsal can be really useful because you're never going to find two patients that have precisely the same configuration of this type of an anomaly. So we've also taken care of patients who have um, very significant um, deviations of the trachea. So it can be too small or it can be too tortuous. If they need something called a tracheostomy tube to help give the pressure that their lungs require, but that, that path to get there is too windy, then the standard off-the-shelf tracheostomy tubes, which are these tubes that go into your neck and ventilate your lungs, are not gonna get there in an effective way. Oh, so then additive is being able to show you the structures inside and whether, and whether or not that standard tube could be used. And if not, then what's the solution? We have solutions that we can try to, to create based on our clinical impression of the patient. But what we've learned is that incorporating additive into that planning process can make it much more specific and valuable to the patient. So we can get a tube designs that will actually function for that patient. But what we realize is that if we can take the patient and get a CT scan of their airway and draw a center line of the air column on that CT scan, we can digitally create a personalized <laughs> tracheostomy tube for this patient and then take those STL files, send them to the manufacturing company that we partner with, and they can actually create a tracheostomy tube that's personalized for this patient. You're not additively making a tracheostomy tube. You are sending off to the manufacturer, but taking those digital files and they're creating it. Like the first patient we tried this on, we were doing endoscopies at the bedside. She was in the hospital for years. And we were to the point of doing them almost weekly, trying to get the right tube to work. And once we got this fixed, they, within like three months, they were not requiring that at all and were discharged within a few more months. Really? And so now they're at home. Yeah. <laughs> like, that's huge. Made a big difference. That's huge massive. Huge difference. Yeah. For this, I mean, very rare patients, but big difference for them. Yeah. That's yeah. just it. But, but the, but this is what's great about what you see here is, no, everybody's unique. I mean, you know, we're all our own pretty little snowflakes, but at the same time, every, every system within everybody's body is unique and additive is able to help the, the, the surgery planning. And we're just talking about um, airways here. You can improve the comfort and the efficiency of the clinical experience by just taking a sharp enough learning curve with a lot of these models. Oh, and by talking about the clinical experience, it's not just the patient, it's it's the medical provider, it's the yeah. doctor, it's their team. It's Every much more stress, less stressful yeah. for them to feel like they have achieved a level, a certain level of competence before they're asked to do it on a live person. It's really just the technical aspects of how we can do things better is really exciting. And so the fact that we were able to do that and create something based on files that we had digitally drawn, which had not been done before in this space to our knowledge is just exciting and fun. But I think the biggest thing really is that, you know, we take a kid who is requiring these procedures basically once a week to try to get something 
that actually works to allow them to be safe enough to leave the hospital. And in, in my opinion, this made the most important difference in getting that transition to occur. So at her discharge party, when everybody was <laughs> letting her, celebrating her being able to go home, you know, this had a lot to do with it. That's really cool. It's really cool. So there's one more thing, if I could show you. Yeah. Uh, our last little option here is the thing I mentioned that is partially additive and partially manufactured. And another category of problems we deal with are functional problems, where the structure is actually fine. But oh. your vocal cords are two things that open and close. Mm -hmm. And when you're talking, they should close. When you're breathing, they should open up really wide. And if they do that all the time, then you have this conversation, you're breathing, you don't even think about it. I don't think about it at no. all, no. But if that is not functioning the way it's supposed to, and your vocal cords are closing when you're trying to breathe in, that doesn't work very well. And this helps with that? So this helps us to understand the problem and to be able to find ways to better manage it. I see. So we can put this helmet on and what we used to do, because the, the thing we want to do is to cap to catch it in the act. Mm -hmm. So you want to be looking at the vocal cords when they're closing, when they should be opening. So you have to look at them in motion. In motion and during activity. So I can put a scope in your nose and I can have you say something and I'll see, your, I'll see them in motion. But that doesn't tell me anything if your symptoms only come up when you're at peak, peak exertion. Okay, so they would just, they would just put this on. We would, and this clips on like a GoPro. Oh, it is a GoPro mount. So we, we put a, a scope in here and we drive that scope through your nose to look at your voice box, clip it into this helmet. So the, the scope is here. It's sitting in your nose. With a tube going here. Down into your throat. Okay. We tape it to your nose, put you on a treadmill and have <laughs> you run your little heart out <laughs> until your symptoms are reproduced. And meanwhile, you're looking at a screen right in front of you with your voice box front and center. Really? Or you can watch it. And a speech therapist who you've worked with for three sessions before that to teach you techniques on how to mitigate that problem, coaching you on using the biofeedback you get from your looking at your larynx to do those techniques better oh. and to fix your problem in oh. real in real time. In real time. Yeah. So you Using, I mean, the additive parts here allow that scope to fit, but then allow you that that real-time biofeedback. And therapy works wonders for most of them, especially with the biofeedback, but there's a small subset that surgery is actually needed, and this helps us to know which is which. The biofeedback plus therapy probably is just monumental in being able to manage this. It, it allows these kids to reach their potential, to get the scholarship they want, <laughs> We've heard stories of patients who've gone through this therapy, and this is a friend of ours from the UK, but they actually could never reach their peak performance and got through this and got the treatment they needed and got a silver medal in swimming after that. So it's like a big That's deal. That's fantastic. It's a big deal. Well, and I mean, not just the silver medal, but quality of life too. Well, it's huge, right? Yeah. I mean, for active people, if you're not able to do the things you love because your voice box closes and we can find a way to help you change that, that's a big deal. That's a huge deal. Oh, this is awesome. Being able to talk about how 3D printing itself has made not just your job easier, but safer for who you're working on with a higher success rate. Yeah. That's brilliant. It's been great. You're actively practicing, like he is a doctor, so you've got things to do. And so I think this conversation was wonderful. And if you wanna know more, there's gonna be ways to find out. Could you look into the camera right there and just tell them that if you wanna find out more about your specialty and what you do, let them know. A lot of what we do is at Seattle Children's and there's websites for that. I work in the Airway and Esophageal Center there. So we've got a, a website with some stories of additive manufacturing stories that uh, how that's affected patients' lives oh, there as well. Well, that was wonderful. If you made it this far, you're awesome. Don't forget to hug each other more. Fight for a cause you believe in and 3D prints, all the things. All and things. as always, high five. Ooh, crisp. Nice. Cool. Hope I didn't damage your surgery. Oh, I'm good. <laughs> <laughs>